Uh, um, if we could begin recording. And there we go. Thank you. I will call to order the Wednesday, October 7th meeting of Narberth Borough Council. Mr. Metric, could you please call the roll? Sure. Uh, Ms. Rickards? Here. Uh, Ms. Pananopoulos? Here. Mr. McGreevy? Here. Ms. Elshax? Here. Uh, Mr. Bush? Here. Vice President Weisbord? Here. Mayor Andrea Deutsch? Here. President Aaron Muterick? Here. Thank you. <clears throat> um, okay. I have no specific comments this evening. Um, Ms. Mayor, anything? Uh, just real brief. Um, I have noticed uh, walking around uh, the borough lately, I've been walking, doing a lot of walking. Um, there's a lot of overgrowth on the, um, on the sidewalks and a little bit blocking some of the signs around town. Uh, I'm going to ask folks to kindly get their hedge clippers out and, and trim up everything and make sure the sidewalks are nice and easy to walk along. And if you have any overgrowth uh, blocking signs, I'm going to ask you to please take it down for everybody's safety. If, uh, if right. there's a problem, we can send you a notice. Okay, thank you. Um, we will now um, recess into executive session, and then we will return to continue the meeting. So, Sean, I'm going to allow you to um, move people to the waiting room. And yeah. then uh, once that is done, we will begin our executive session. Yeah, Hopefully so, it won't take too long, but it could be as long as 30 minutes. Yeah, so members of the public, what's going to happen is you'll, you'll be uh, put in the waiting room. Please stay on the call. As soon as we're done, I can just grab you right back out of the waiting room and bring you back into this, this room and the meeting will restart. So thank you all very much. I'm going to start doing that now. Okay, great. Is two six seven two four six five four eight six someone's phone on council? I don't think so. I believe that is everybody, and I'm going to pause the recording. Okay, pause the recording. I'm just reviewing. Who's on two one five nine eight nine? That's Bob Boysboard's number. Oh, for his audio. Okay. And Kurt and Matt, um, the Civic is still here. My bad. It's okay. President Muterick, would you like me to stay for the meeting? Did you want to, me to come back in later? It's really up to you in council. I would like you to stay for the meeting. I think we're going to move along here. And then I think, um, well, I wanted to announce to members of the public, we, or we should start the recording. Um, thank you. Uh, we met in executive session to discuss matters of uh, potential litigation and personnel matters. And um, we will be meeting in executive session following this meeting to discuss same. Uh, so thank you, John, if you could stick around for a little while. Um, let's go to uh, 5A, capital plan and budget. Mr. West is somewhere. Hi. Well, I could I could start. We have we have made the um, um, amendments to the capital plan and budget that were collected at our last business meeting. Um, there was some additional conversation that happened at the infrastructure committee the following week that uh, weren't incorporated into those changes because that could be discussed in this uh, this forum right here. But all of the things that were discussed um, moving moving the public works vehicle expenditure out a year, moving the uh, um, not spending anything that is not uh, ADA or um, a public safety uh, uh, contingent um, and removing the, um, the two pieces of work at the 201 Sabon campus for the parking lot and, and uh, sidewalk, um, sidewalk and ADA issues that are at, at that site. Um, so 
I appreciate the process. Um, it made those amendments really easy. I didn't think there was a lot to uh, regurgitate or reiterate unless unless you wanted to at this meeting. Um, of course, you can you can. I'm happy to keep talking on it. Um, but I appreciate that it was organized. So there shouldn't really be any surprises uh, in the document I sent around this afternoon because it all ties back into those recommendations made at our last public meeting. Well, I'll punt to council. Any, did you see any surprises or have any questions, council members? Hearing none. So well, seems I mean, like- a, when, ahead, when do you Fred. want to talk about, so there, there were some infrastructure discussion. Do you want to have that now? Do you want to have that later during the infrastructure report? Um, I, I think if they're part of the capital plan or the budget, why don't we discuss them now? Okay. Um, as opposed to maybe more forward looking <laughs> items, which we could discuss uh, during your committee report. Okay. Um, well, in some sense, they are forward looking. I mean, they're within the five year time frame of the um, capital plan. Okay. Um, so one thing is the PRP. There is approximately. Excuse, excuse me. I'm sorry to interrupt you, Fred. I'm just want to ask whoever's hosting the meeting to to mute every microphone except for the person who's speaking because it's is a lot a lot of background noise. And I don't know if it's coming from the Civic Association somewhere else, but thank you for the consideration. Sorry to interrupt, Fred. No, it's fine. Um, so there's. The, the budget amounts for the um, PRP are imprecise. We don't know exactly what it's going to cost. But right now, uh, the estimate is 675000 over a five-year span once it's accepted by the state. Um, so that, a lot of that fits within the scope of this you know, five-year capital plan. So we should probably put some numbers down to reflect that um, because those are going to be big commitments for the borough, big dollar commitments that we should plan ahead for. Um, so that's, that's issue number one. Um, Sean, do you have thoughts about that? You're on mute. You have to remind me of the conversation we had at, at infrastructure. There are, um, stormwater, you know, there's stormwater dollars in the budget, but it's, it's, um, those PRP dollars don't appear until next year's uh, budget cycle starting July 1st, 2021. Um, I think that number, I'll have to pull it up here. Um, the number is more or less $45,000. <clears throat> You're talking about the stormwater improvements like that. That was the uh, sort of gradual upgrade of our storm sewers, right? That we were planning to be spending over time. I think that's what that money was, the 45000 a year. That That is money that could be used for PRP improvements, for um, um, stormwater improvements that we have to make, like the ones that we're, you know, we're doing this year. Um, and I agree, it's not enough to um, tackle everything we see in the PRP. And I think that it may be premature to, on the one hand, I, I hear what Fred is saying about if you don't, if you don't put it down, don't plan for it, you, you increase the chances of not doing it. I guess that's where, where, he, where you might be coming from, Fred. Um, but I also think that's balanced by um, uh, we really don't know yet what the what it's like to build a one of the 17 um, on-street pieces of green stormwater infrastructure that the PRP calls for. We don't have that process figured out, and and that number in the PRP um, is um, has a high margin of error, let me put it that way. Uh, you could have uh, cheaper interventions, you're most likely to have more expensive interventions, and it might have to do with the location that you choose to implement those. So I, I still think we have a really steep learning curve to go up where those dollars would need to be adjusted. Um, and that's, that's kind of my two cents on it, Aaron and Fred. Okay, Fred? I mean, I understand there's uncertainty. I think we really should be looking strongly for grant partners to help us handle this. And I think, you know, having 
having a number, you know, on our budget to help focus our minds on that will will help us uh, as we proceed through this. And we have we know that there's this giant, you know, project that's looming over us, and we should be aware of it as we proceed. So, do you think for this cycle, um, given that we don't really have a exact number, um, you know, we can have, the infrastructure committee can be cognizant of that for the next cycle. And then hopefully we can have that information to integrate at the next step, the next time we review this. Okay, yeah, I mean, if that's the will of council, we can do that. Um, just be aware that this is out there. Yeah. And let me let me speak for the will of the administration too. I, I think it's it's incumbent on us and, and we're, we're excited about it too, to work on this next year and to, to work with our borough engineer and see what one of these, um, one of these interventions look like and price it out. So the next time we come around to this conversation in our next annual cycle, which will which will be on us sooner than we think, that that we'll have a we'll be in a better position to make a decision. Um, so it doesn't. I think it is something we are presently. It's in our heads, and it's pre we want to presently work on it. And we're going to be starting our inventory this fall and winter, and we're going to also be. Um, exploring um, a project specific project location that that makes the most sense with what we know about our condition of our infrastructure and all the other factors that influence where and when you, we do a project and that's the that's the idea of uh, traffic circulation and all the other uses that inhabit a street and um, I'm looking forward to that I think I think we'll know more and be able to make better decisions as we learn Okay. Right. Mona? Um, so I have Cindy. a question. Please tell me if it's because I'm reading the budget wrong, but um, I see, I thought we had decided on council not to put money into vehicle replacement unless it was an emergency. And I see vehicle replace, I see two line items of vehicle replacement under 2021, 2022. Should I be looking under 2020, 2021? Am I looking on the wrong column? Um, the way the capital plan is structured for the time being, and this could change going forward, is that the spending that gets authorized by adoption of the plan is only the, only the current or next year's spending. So when we reevaluate our capital plan in the next cycle, we can look at those two looming expenditures for PW and, and the police department and make a decision then whether or not we're going to do that. So a decision we make today doesn't lock us into spending we would make in the 21-22 cycle, but it does lock us into the 2021 strike cycle. So I interpret if the council were to adopt this plan as it would be authorization and, and um, mandate to say, get these things done that are in this column this year. Got it. I was looking in the wrong column. Thank you. Cindy. Um, just kind of a comment. So sh we discussed last week, Sean and I just dis discussed today the idea of a public safety infrastructure. Um, and you can see there are no dollars allotted, but I would, I would actually suggest that um, from the infrastructure and equipment category, that bicycle and pedestrian infrastructure is absolutely pu a public safety infrastructure investment. Um, that streetlight purchases and improvement are absolutely a public safety uh, infrastructure investment and um, stormwater system improvements. Um, you know, I think three of those actually are some of the most um, critical, pertinent, and timely investments we can do for the public health and safety of our community. And while it doesn't necessarily make much of a difference right now on an Excel sheet, I do think that it really does begin to change kind of our philosophy and approach to public health and safety, um, particularly on the heels of the climate action plan, which I can see kind of straddling both operating and capital budget. And I, I just think it would be helpful for all of us to begin to think about those investments as public health and safety initiatives and not solely infrastructure. So bridge, um, public works vehicles, um, you know, road paving, clearly infrastructure, but it's important. I think that detail is important to, to recognize as something other than just equipment. That's all. 
Yeah, and infrastructure has recommended that um, as we proceed with the road paving project, we allocate you know time and money to uh, improve the sidewalks alongside that roadway and to look at crosswalks, to look at um, you know intersections, whether we have ADA compliant uh, ramps on the sidewalks, and to you know to speak with landowners to repair sidewalks as necessary on the property, so basically to proceed alongside. And um, so that's not really reflected in the in the funding right now in the in the capital plan. Right now, we agreed we were going to do a hundred thousand a year in road paving. So there is a suggestion that that you know that hundred thousand could also you know we could do a little less road paving and and some of the sidewalk work with that hundred thousand, or we could allocate some money alongside that every year um, to as a complete streets project to uh, you know. Uh, bring the, the sidewalks, you know, to, to help pedestrians and, and bicyclists and other, other modalities of travel as well as cars as we uh, do the repaving. Yeah, thanks. I appreciate how you have it spelled out, John. I mean, if you had put those three categories I just suggested into that public safety infrastructure, it wouldn't have been as clear and obvious, but I do think it's important for us to start to kind of consider that philosophy and lens. Okay. Um, do we want to make that change now? Cindy, is that what you're asking for? Well, I, I, I don't know. I think that's up to you. I mean, I, I think it's just kind of shifting stuff on the form and potentially a new header. Um, you know, this is my perspective of you utilizing the built environment as one of our public health sure. tools. Um, well, so there's two, maybe two questions. Do we, does council have a desire to do that? And does council have a desire to do that right now? Um, you know, on the plan we're, we're about to adopt. It doesn't really change the plan. It just reorganizes it for us. Right. So we're, but if we're going to adopt a plan tonight, we should, you know, we should make a decision. I mean, uh, yeah, I'm, I'm interested to know if that would be a lot of uh, work entailed in doing that, because I like I like the idea. I think it does change the way we think about these things going forward. Sean, do you have some feedback on what you're hearing and how easy that might be to do? Yeah, I do. I think that um, a good way to knit these disparate, I, I think we're just talking about how do we, how do we make it make sense and how does it tie into a bigger idea that we're, we're building through our comprehensive plan goals. And I'm okay with the labeling the way it is presented on the spreadsheet. What I thought we could do is plug into public safety infrastructure, all those improvements that are related to traffic calming. Um, you know, you're, you're um, moving of the, if you're gonna do a bump out, the costs that are associated with moving that curb line could be put into that public safety infrastructure piece because you're limiting traffic speeds, you're slowing turns, you're creating more, less time that the pedestrian is exposed moving across the street, you're making a safer environment. So I'm seeing public safety infrastructure as a line item that we can populate with traffic calming improvements. And again, getting back to the same issue we have with putting the PRP into motion and stormwater improvements, we don't know yet, but we will know really soon as we look at the paving program next year. We have dollars in our paving program to pay for the asphalt. Um, maybe we come back to council when we have an idea and a plan and a location that is the right block or blocks to tackle first because we have investigated the underground infrastructure and are satisfied that we're making a prudent investment. That maybe we come back and, and talk about some additional funds for um, a traffic calming uh, improvement and, and getting at the idea that Fred was talking about an infrastructure. Council members, thoughts? Mona, you were gonna say something. Uh, mine was on a different issue, so should I wait? Okay. Okay. I, I mean, yeah. I would say we have 100K on the budget for um, <clears throat> the paving. I think we should allocate some money alongside for, uh, Sure, public safety infrastructure, which would include the uh, the sidewalk improvements and any you know traffic calming that we feel is appropriate to go there. I would say maybe another twenty five thousand dollars. I mean, <clears throat> since this is a project for next year, I think we should put a tentative number on it. I don't think this is something that's way out in advance. I think 
you know, if there's a number there, we'll be, we'll be ready to, you know, it's something to work with. I'm seeing nodding. Um, do I have enough nods? I don't know. Rob, you're nodding. Bob, Mona. Okay. Uh, alternately, uh, if we don't have the money to set aside, I mean, another way to do it is to say we look at that $100,000 and say it's not all just for street paving. It's for street paving and sidewalk and other public safety improvements. And we're just going to do the paving at a slower pace, right? So the money just doesn't do the streets as quickly. I mean, so it's not necessarily the case that we have to put a number alongside it. We could just understand that road paving includes all the things that we just talked about, re right. regardless of what the, of, what, of how the numbers are identified or described. Okay. Okay. Um, let's hold on that. Mona, you had another topic. I, I think well, it's, oh, oh, I was going to say, Aaron, on the go last ahead, topic. Go ahead, Bob. Jump I'm in. Sorry. Yeah. Um, just, yeah. I think, I think it's important to give it some kind of, I'm fine with Michelle's suggestion, but I think we should, it should have a label like road paving and traffic calming or something. So okay. like some, some label that just keeps them, keeps at the front of mind what, so we don't have this conversation again next year, you know? Okay. Well, we can definitely change a label uh, more easily um, than, you know, sort of adding dollars and moving things around if we're looking to adopt something tonight. Right? More nods. Okay. Okay. Mona. So I noticed that we were definitely putting in money for stormwater sewers, but I also noticed that there's no money for sanitary sewers next year. So I'm curious to get the feel of council. I, I feel like these sewers are very old, maybe ending their usable life. We don't know, but I, I feel like to save money in the long run, maybe we should put some money up front for sanitary sewers as well before we repave the roads and then have to repave them again because we find out that there's a break in a sanitary sewer that we didn't know was coming. So I'm wondering how what counts what council would feel about allocating some money to sanitary sewers and what and what our staff um, thinks would be possible as well. Sean, I'm I'm going right to you for this. But again, I think it's I think everyone's talking. I, I hear a lot of good ideas. I hear I hear eagerness to address our core infrastructure. You're making Matt very excited, although he's not. He's not showing his excitement. Um, this is re this is really the 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 main. This is the meat and potatoes. If you're if you're an omnivore of municipal management and and taking care of the infrastructure, we're charged with taking care of. Um, what we will seek to do, Mona, is with our preliminary the assessment that we're going to start uh, this year and then continue through next year, <clears throat> is identify um, roadways where we have. Um, uh, infrastructure that's functional and working so that when we do put a pave, when we do repave that um, portion of our street network, we know that uh, chances are good that we are not going to have a problem on that section of street okay. anytime before the paving needs to be done again. And paving lasts about 20 years, more or less, depending, you know, that's a good average. Mm -hmm. um, and in that assessment, we're going to we're going to hopefully find our spots where we know there's a problem. It, I'm looking forward to the day where we discovered we would have discovered the collapse at 415 Conway Avenue before 10 inches of rain fell and had and were able to proactively plan for that and, and make that um, make that repair and, and investment ahead of time instead of being reactive. I mean, that's our big goal here. So. We definitely agree. Uh, we do not want to pave something that we ever we would have to come back in in the lifetime of that uh, paving and redo again. That's that would drive me nuts. Anyone else? There were a couple other minor points. One is that um, the Parks and Recreation Board has not yet been able to finalize their recommendations, so. Okay. They're probably going to come back with some more uh, requests for us to consider later. 
after we've passed okay. this, amend, to amend the bill. Um, and the second question I had was about the, um, the are the police cameras still on the budget for next year? Um, I couldn't tell what was in the police, you know, spending. I'm glad you asked because I had um, talked with uh, the mayor and Chief Gallagher about that before the meeting. So maybe John would send that your way, that question your way. Sure. Thank you, Sean. And, and thank you, Fred, for the question. Um, right now, the uh, uh, Fred, are you talking about the mobile video recorders in the cars or the body worn cameras? Uh, the body cameras. So the body worn cameras, there's no, as you know, in the capital improvement plan, there is no cost allocated to that line as we are going to discuss that further. Um, the one thing that we need to take into consideration is if we are going to go into a body worn camera project, it's got to be tied into your firearm as well as your taser. Uh, there's certain, there's certain specifications that should be met with a body worn camera project. So in other words, when an officer walks more than one mile an hour, um, it should automatically feed. It should go on right away. Uh, there are certain manual overrides that should be allowed, and then there's others that should not. Um, and one of the things that's a must, um, you know, is, uh, is, is automatic activation when uh, leather is left, whether it's on a gun or on a taser. Uh, so this way it is rolling and, uh, and it, uh, the entire incident is captured on film. Um, one of the things that, uh, that we did research on Fred about two years ago, two and a half years ago was an officer, what was referred to as an officer safety package from Axon, uh, for a body worn camera project that was connected to our tasers. Our tasers are woefully outdated. Uh, they're kind of hanging on by a wing and a prayer. Uh, we have to get them replaced. This has kind of been a discussion for a while, probably Fred, uh, before you, uh, you got here. Um, so just kind of filling you in. Um, we're kind of revisiting this conversation. Um, you know, uh, body worn cameras are the standard in the police industry. There are very few townships, boroughs, um, you know, in Montgomery County and the surrounding counties, uh, that do not have body worn cameras. They are a must to, uh, protect officers from frivolous accusations. And it does a lot to, in, uh, you know, um, it, it minimize exposure for, uh, police agencies, boroughs, organizations, townships, and cities from, with uh, different incidents that are high profile. Uh, and it really is a transparent way to record, um, you know, uh, police interaction with the community. The other thing is too, the one thing I can tell you, Fred, um, you know, not so much from a financial perspective, but also uh, from a, um, you know, a professional perspective that when you turn that camera on, officers have an obligation to notify the citizen that they're interacting with that the camera is on. Uh, and you can almost see instantaneously that their behavior changes. Uh, for instance, if they know that the camera is on and it's being filmed, sometimes they're they're much more cooperative with police, and it really de-escalates situations very effectively. Um, so uh, these are just some of the things. I think overall, as a group, we should probably talk about what we're going to do in order to get that allocated. Um, you know, there are many different projects, many different levels of service that come with packages. Um, uh, from the research I've done, Axon is probably the, you know, the leading standard, uh, but, uh, it does come at a cost. There's no doubt about that. And, uh, there are certain options and alternatives where you can have, uh, an entire officer safety package plan, which is managed by the company. Uh, they store the information in a the cloud. There's backups. Uh, there's all sorts of, uh, different, uh, projects and packages that we get into and which I can certainly share at a future date. Uh, but overall, it's just good for us to put that in the capital improvement plan to start this conversation again. Uh, and as you know, um, you know, the challenges in policing uh, today are very difficult. Uh, and, um, you know, these are, are just one more uh, one more ad, one more tool that that helps uh, that helps, you know, insulate communities uh, from uh, risk exposure, including, you know, liability. Um, so that's kind of where we're at. Is any any does that help? Yeah, thank you. Okay, thank you. Okay. Anything else, Fred? Anything else in the discussion of the capital plan? And we'll have another opportunity when we uh, get down to motions. Okay. Fred, back to you. Other items on your committee report? Yeah. 6A. So, uh, some of the borough's capital projects um, are still a little backlogged due to some manufacturing slowdowns for the uh, the baseball netting and um, the EV stations. Yeah. 
Um, so we're still, I believe, waiting to <laughs> receive delivery of those and, and uh, install them. Um, okay. Let's see. The, we talked about the stormwater management threshold. Um, we, I think there's consensus that the borough should be lowering its uh, threshold for stormwater review for renovations and for new projects. We're going to keep talking about it and maybe come back with a, a recommendation next month. Um, among other things, this would uh, help us get some PRP credit for stormwater uh, changes that would be put in by private land. I think we're we're all concerned that you know a new house went in and they didn't really fall under the uh, the stormwater review guidelines. Um, so we we're trying to figure out the the right number to to set so that um, we capture major projects like a new house and make sure they're um, yeah you know doing their part to reduce stormwater. Um, talked about the. Uh, Capital plan changes. Uh, the other big thing was the uh, the DVRC, uh, the DVRPC, and the bike lane discussion. So um, I've been on two phone calls um, with DVRPC about um, you know pop up bike lane. Um, we're coalescing right now about the idea of doing um, a one block pilot project. Uh, in November or December, um, just to get some of the sort of give the bro some practice in, in uh, what this would look like, uh, get some feedback from residents and uh, just gather some information about how it would work uh, for a larger pilot. And so the, the timeline would be uh, short projects, uh, November, December, I mean, assuming council agrees. Um, a larger pilot uh, in the spring that could then segue into a like a permanent uh, setup. Looking at the block of Windsor between uh, Forest and North Narberth, um, and uh, we're gonna have another discussion next week. So I'm hoping I can have more details um, at the business meeting, and we can uh, okay. you know discuss it more. See what we, yeah. And see what I the think, costs are, et cetera. Yeah, I think everybody's pretty excited. This would just be a like a ten or eleven day project as envisioned, so it should be fairly inexpensive on the borough's end. Um, I think everybody's excited on the on the call, so hopefully I'll have more info uh, at the next meeting. Uh, that's about it. And we talked briefly about the two hundred one Sabine um, meeting, which we had last Wednesday. Um, I don't know if now's the time to discuss that or how you want to, should we, I mean, many of the council members were on that um, um, Zoom I, meeting. I did not have 201 Sabine on this agenda. Okay. Um, maybe we can discuss that actually at the first meeting in November because we'll have, we'll have had the, uh, the larger community meeting at that point and okay. uh, have a lot more data and information to hash out. Yeah, there's there's no action that council is taking on this right now. So, um, right that community meeting. Uh, what's the date on that, Sean? It's October twenty seventh. Twenty seventh. Okay, that's a Tuesday night. <clears throat> All right, and I'm sure we'll be publicizing that. That will be a chance for everybody to weigh in on the uh, yep to one save my property, and then um, parking Indeed. study task force, which is coming up later anyway. So. That's coming up. Okay. Thanks. Um, finance and administration, Councillor Rickards. Uh, so FNA, obviously, we're spending some time on the capital plan and the budget, but there are two kind of looming issues that we've kind of um, sidebarred mm -hmm. to to see if we, we have any interest in pursuing um, and what that timeline would be. The first would be the process for um, the business privilege tax. Uh, that Mona's headed up and just the timeline um, we had said to the office, you know, what is a reasonable timeline? A is, I should step, step back, A is it a priority of council and then B, what would that timeline be? Um, I think the timeline would be longer um, now, just given with the uh, bandwidth issues. And the second issue would be, uh, you know, do we want to explore some sort of public private partnership for retail recruitment to support businesses? Um, through retail recruitment and grants, um, we had said, you know, is there any money that we can find in the budget to support that? Is it worth even having a conversation um, with businesses, with landlords and council to see what options we have? So those are the two topics for discussion. Okay. 
any comments or questions from other council members? Sorry. All right. Well, let, let me ask the question. Business privilege tax, is it a priority? We didn't put it on our uh, priority list that Bob organized, but it's really come to the attention that it's something that we need to pay attention to. Um, do we want to tell the office that's a priority um, and ask for a timeline? That's the first question. Man. Council members, Andrea? Um, with the business privilege tax, is the goal to, to increase our collection rate from those who, who are just currently not paying? You know what? It's even I, I can let Mona answer this. It's a little even bit more involved. It's even first identifying who owes the business privilege tax. It's not even just about collection. So it, it is a little bit more complex. But Mona, maybe you can, can I Can I ask that we postpone a discussion about this till our next meeting? Because I'm going to meet with Sean and Matt about it next week. Oh, perfect. We off sure. I think well, it it'll be easier to discuss more details once we have a meeting. No perfect. problem. All okay. right. Okay. All right. Next item. And part two: Do we want to pursue the investigation of some sort of perhaps public-private support of bringing someone in to help with um, business grant writing or retail recruitment? All right, I'll jump in. Thanks, Aaron. Um, I I think the that we do. And normally I would look at this as a budget item and say, gosh, we don't have the money for this. But, you know, retail is it really at a, an unknown time. And um, I think, you know, we see our downtown as our crown jewel. It's the thing that sort of centers all of us in this community. So I would, I would even consider sort of some very creative ways of coming up with the boroughs portion of that funding. And I think that given some of the consolidation in real estate uh, in those commercial spaces, we may be able to find some additional support uh, from those owners uh, to help us make this success. Great, that's what I was thinking. I'm seeing uh, nods, as, okay. Great point, as both, the, as both the mayor and a business owner downtown, I can tell you the shape of retail has dramatically changed during uh, the last six, eight months. Uh, and so um, it probably would be smart to do something like that because, uh, uh, you know, we're in, we're in very challenging times and I think everybody's going to be fighting for different, um, uh, different potential retailers to, to populate their towns. Mm -hmm. And I, it's less it's about, um, in my opinion, you know, retail under COVID, it's more about what retail is going to look like after COVID and spending that time and, and trying to make some bets um, and, and you know, trying to vision that so that it doesn't just happen to us, but we, we have a little bit of control. Yeah. yeah, and I wanted to add to that as well, that you know, we have the bridge, isn't it? the bridge, the new bridge construction is in the office. And so that will, that will certainly be a draw for any new businesses coming to town will be the hope that the new bridge will be will be constructed and complete. And I think at least we need we, we need some assistance with our downtown at least until the bridge is complete. It may not be that we need it to go on forever, but I'm very much in favor of doing something sooner rather yeah. than waiting. Bob, you bring up a great point. And then I'd like to make a suggestion after a review. You know, when I spoke to someone just doing fact finding, the co consultant said your bridge mitigation is going to be a real issue. You know, COVID to Aaron's point and Andrea's point has reshaped retail. That's going to be a real issue. But Narberth has such a well-established relationship with its businesses. It's not, it's not like we need a big corridor manager or anything that you're really talking about, um, you know, post COVID time to really help support our downtown and recovery. So I'd like to suggest then Aaron, maybe the two of us can do some fact finding and have some conversation, think about creative ways to engage maybe public partner partnerships and then bring it to F and A and then to council. Okay, Rob, I'm sorry. I know you want to comment. Go ahead, Rob. Yeah. I just wanted to add um, retail retention. I mean, from, from what I recall from um, our economic development committee work, the retention piece may be easier to achieve than recruiting new uh, shop owners. And, you know, that's just as much a challenge, right, for us, given all that's happening, is to hold on to the businesses. So it, I just wanted to add that piece. 
some of that, Rob, um, maybe facilitating transfers of ownership, right? You have a business that's successful. You have someone who's, you know, it's owner operated, right? They're coming to the end of their career rather than closing. It's facilitating connections um, to keep that open. That benefits the new operator who doesn't have to make significant capital investment in, in a new space and, and also gives someone an exit strategy. Um, and a good recruiter can do that. And so, yeah, I agree. Um, okay, Cindy, we'll link up on that. Yeah, okay, then stay tuned, folks. Great, public health and safety. Okay, so we met just prior to this meeting. And um, as you know, we have reviewed the police policies and they have been posted on the website. And my thanks to the mayor and the chief for that. We have now with the accepted cap, uh, we're moving forward in implementation. So the committee is starting to think about how we might budget for the cap going into next year. And that's a discussion that we're having. Um, one, one thing that I, I just want to put on the table here, one element of the, uh, of the cap is to consider a kind of shadow pricing scheme or uh, a carbon fee um, so that when we are considering vehicle purchases going forward, we consider the true cost of the vehicle if it's a, if it's a gas powered vehicle we include in the cost a um, carbon fee that would account for the emissions over the lifespan of the vehicle. And this would give us a way of kind of comparing the costs of a gas powered vehicle versus an electric vehicle. Um, this is something that we're, we've been talking about and it's recommended in the cap, um, but we're not at a position to kind of make formal, we're not ready to make a formal recommendation. We wanna work through that with the staff. Um, so also on the EAC, we got an update from Matt West on the streetlight project um, and also um, the power switch uh, project to switch our electric to renewables for the borough. Um, and um, so there's, there's a lot of work to kind of implement the climate action plan. And I, I imagine that will be a big part of the operating budget discussion. And I've asked the committee to consider this for our, our November meeting, which will be the first week of November for the committee, so that as a committee, we're in a position to make recommendations for the operating budget discussion. Um, so let's see, a few other things have been on our plate. Um, a couple residents have brought to our attention a uh, barking dog nuisance and uh, we have been discussing how best to handle that and we're going to come to a decision as a committee in, at our next meeting in November. Um, there have also been public comments made about a new shop opening, a smoke shop on Haverford Avenue, um, but we do not have a recommendation on that either. As you know, we have we have moved forward the mask ordinance, which we will be uh, voting on. And um, I believe just, that's it for now. Rob, tell me if I'm overextending here, uh, or Sean also. Uh, if, if a store is moving in on Habford Avenue, my understanding it's the former Venus Nails location um, with like a, a smoke a smoke shop or a vape shop. That is a permitted use under our zoning code. And um, discussion would not be, a council doesn't decide whether we let a business in, that, that, right? That's not how we do it. The zoning code decides what's a permitted use. Yeah, um, but go ahead, Sean. Yeah, the determination is made by the zoning officer. <clears throat> in this particular case, we didn't have any record of the zoning permit being applied for. So it is a change of use in that location from personal service possibly to retail. So I've asked the zoning officer to inquire and get that straightened away. But uh, that doesn't <clears throat> preclude public health and safety from coming forward with a recommendation to changes to the zoning code if uh, for future use um, um, or um, other changes to what is permissible in the borough's public spaces, et cetera, um, as it may relate to that committee. So and, right, and, that, that jives. 
not not to throw shade on any one business over any, over the other, but there's an overall umbrella over every single use in the borough that it has to legal it has to be legal and comply with all other regulations and, and, and mm -hmm. laws. And you you know you can't you let your imagination go. You you can't do things that are retail but are are not permitted by under by some either state or local or federal law. Right. Okay. Anything else, Rob? Uh, just one other, Mona. one other item, Aaron. Um, related to the mask ordinance, our committee had discussed um, a recommendation of, of signs and signage, you know, um, at some point in support of the mask ordinance. And I also wanted just to note for the, for the council that we have received only one objection um, to the mask ordinance. From a resident. Okay. Although it wasn't clear that it was a Norbert's resident. Okay. Mona? So, uh, and I'm just wondering if now is the time to bring it up or if I should send an email to Councillor John. But the in terms of the mask ordinance, um, a resident did ask tonight at Public Health and Safety Committee whether it exempted people within six feet. Like if you're in the park and you're within six feet and that's the way I had read it, that masks are only required in the park if you're within six feet of other people. But I did a quick reread and from my reread, it looks like maybe we need to amend that to make it more clearly because the exceptions in the park. So, oh, okay. So without getting into all of the details of the language, would that be something that I'd talk about tonight just to make it really clear that if you're in the park and you're not within six feet of anyone else, would we talk about that now? Would I email our solicitor? Would I email you? How does that work? Well, I, I would have to look at the ordinance just to make sure. I thought this was the topic of a, a longer conversation we had uh, at the meeting and um, where we went back and forth. And I, I thought that we said that if you're in park, that or did we i'd have to see what was changed but i i, I think it's pretty clear in the ordinance one way or another do you, does anyone recall well, i'll tell you what yeah john why don't you um I'll look that take up a right minute now, to well, review well, and we're, we're going to get to that ordinance in a couple minutes and then we'll we'll be able to get you that answer once that goes on oh, to the so table, we are Mona. we are getting to that ordinance i'm sorry that's what i okay sorry yeah no, gonna, i'll look that up right now okay uh it's not up for adoption but we we can you know punt this a little bit down the agenda Okay. And, um, Sorry. and we can get that answer. Um, so okay. Real quick. So going back to streetlights for a minute, we did have that request from the resident of Hanson Court who wanted to know what the status of yes. the street lighting project was in general and specifically, you know, what the status was of taking care of their particular street lights on Hanson Court. That's me. I, uh, oh. uh, as you may recall, I uh, appeared at one of the meetings last year, just about a year ago. And uh, I, I know uh, COVID has put a, well, Je a Jerry, delay on everything. Jerry, hold on. Jerry, okay. the floor is still for, for council members here. I'm going to ask Mr. West uh, right. to, uh, to just give us an update. And then when we get to public comment, uh, which is imminent, I will uh, we'll have an opportunity for you to speak. All right. Go thank ahead, you. Matt. Yep. Thank you, Mr. President. So I am, um, I've been in contact with our representative from DVRPC and our lighting consultant, Mike Fuller. Um, I got an email from both of them last week saying that the PUC, the, the Public Utilities Commission, has finally convened. And unfortunately, they rejected the application from PICO. Um, oh, yeah, there's more. Wait, there's more. Um, I, I don't, I couldn't get a straight answer as to why. But um, long story short, they instructed PICO to redo the purchase agreement between PICO and the borough. And there are other boroughs and municipalities who are also in the same boat. Um, the good news is that um, it is going to cost the borough less to purchase the, the lights. So that's the good news. Um, bad news is that, um, you know, it, it's just it, the window of opportunity for it to be done this year it's not looking good. So it's not on our consultant side, it's not on our construction side, it's all in PICO and the PUC's hands right now. Um, so depending upon how quickly uh, we can turn that around, we'll then determine once we can get it into the construction schedule uh, with Mike Fuller and his crew. 
Um, regarding the uh, Hanson Court issue, um, I'm not fully up to speed with um, where we stand with those two lights. I believe Mr. Lyons is referring to the two lights on the entranceway, which are on the columns. Um, I did get um, caught up to speed on an email that Mr. Metric had sent to Mr. Lyons some time ago, um, saying that you know the borough would consider um, taking ownership of those two lights and and the columns, but it opens up a much larger discussion about you know, are we going to maintain those columns? We would then be in the right to take those lights out and the columns out since they are technically, I believe, in the right of way. Um, and so it, that's a much more complicated, even though it's just like, you know, it's two little lights. Um, it's a much more complicated conversation than just saying, yes, the borough will take them. Um, there's the, the, they can't be included in the streetlight program because we currently don't own them. They're not on our network. There's no way for us to turn that switch on. So it's a, I, I, I want to separate those two. Um, Hanson Court is included in, in, in the larger project. Just those two lights are not. Um, it is a more difficult conversation and agreement to have um, that would include certainly some input from solicitor. So Matt, with that, with that said, maybe Sean, seems like there's, there's a variety of, and I'll use air quotes, orphan infrastructure that's sort of scattered around the borough. Uh, some stormwater, some lights, other sort of um, boundary areas, private roads, et cetera. Um, do you see this coming on as a larger discussion that's gonna have to come to council with some decision-making? I think to, you know, to, to purchase the infrastructure, yes, it's two lights. Like I said, we have what, 350 lights are in this deal, Matt, not, not right. including the downtown lights. So you're talking at less than 1% of the whole universe of light purchasing. <clears throat> our, our position on the administration side is street lighting is a core municipal function. So obviously you don't want an HOA or a private landowner in, in charge of lighting a street. It just doesn't seem right. Um, <clears throat> So that, that's my general position on those, those two lights. And okay. sure, you know, look at when we get closer to implementing, we were gonna look at the contractor and see if we could get um, uh, a couple of, yeah, since we're working with the contractor why, and you're, they're gonna be putting in 300 and I'll say the number, maybe 325 lights. Can we, can we, can we on our dime, so to speak, buy two more and, and work mm -hmm. out the logistics of that mm -hmm. and just bring that into the portfolio of the, of the boroughs <clears throat> um, lighting system. Okay. And we'll need John to help us to figure out how you buy something from somebody you can't figure out who actually owns it. But I think we can figure that wow. out. Yeah. And it's not just the lights. I just want to reiterate that that's the easy yeah. part. It's the electrical circuit that's also connected to it in the account. So it's going to include Pico again. And so that's just going to be another wrinkle that we'll have to deal with. Can I ask a quick question? I, I don't want to belabor this. Up. Who pays for the electricity now? Is, is it attached to a house or an, a private owner? Jerry, you can jump in on this if you know. Um, years ago, when Hanson Court was built, and I've discussed this with uh, uh, two of the original owners of Han in Hanson Court, um, the bill went to one of the residents here, but they opened up a separate account called the Hanson Court account. Um, over the years, um, the account accumulated money, but as people moved out of the Anna Hanson Court and new people moved in, um, the money dwindled down. And I think uh, last year around this time when I came to the council meeting was when the budget hit, was when our account hit zero. So um, I do not believe the electric line is actually attached to any house. One of the, uh, uh, one of the designated residents of Hanson Court would manage the account. It wasn't in their personal name. It was in the quote, Hanson Court account, um, but there's nothing in it. As for the pillars themselves, uh, I think we're all at the point, if you want to knock them down and put up maintenance-free street lamps there, I don't think any, any Hanson Court resident would object to that. 
Um, the bill itself was extremely minimal. I think it, uh, it came in, what, $25, $30 a month. Um, but it's just that we feel it's really part of, of Norbirth. They are actually not owned by anybody. In fact, if, if uh, and, and Mayor, you might have, have noticed this as well, there's even caution tape around one of them because the masonry is falling apart and no one actually owns it. So uh, a lot of the residents, myself and my neighbors, we, if you notice, we fixed the wall because that is on our property, but those two lights are actually not on anybody's property. Um, the, uh, uh, the people on the corner have had it surveyed. It is actually not on their property. Um, in okay. fact, I think, so, at the meet, I think at the meeting last year, I even brought the, uh, a layout, a map of, uh, you did, of yeah. Hanson Court. And it was very clear that those two lights that we want Norbert to take over or to just assume control eminent domain, whatever, uh, theory you want to apply. I don't think you have to buy it from anybody. I think the biggest expense would probably be to find a lawyer to actually do the paperwork. Um, right. but you know, nobody so, owns so in them. that sense. What I'm hearing is, uh, I think there's an opportunity, uh, with sort of a general consent, we don't need a vote to, to sort of agree with the administration that, you know, the borough could take ownership of these lights. The residents of Hanson court would be under a general understanding that once the borough does, it can do whatever it likes with them, um, change their form structure. Um, and, if, the, if in any way this is a t connected to the Street Lake project, that sort of happens, you know, that's at the level of the administration and the contractor. But really, we're, the Street Lake project is a, is a large project and um, it sort of moves along at, on its own. Do any council members have a thought or opinion, like, you know, against that idea? Um, and then we, we can sort of, we can clear this off of the council table, but also we can, we can get, Hanson Court, um, sort of out of limbo. All right, people think seem to think that sounds like a plan. So that's that's going to be that's our plan. Yeah, thank you for bringing this to our attention and keeping our attention on it. I mean, like as you pointed out, there is a certain amount of orphaned infrastructure, and it's it's easy to forget that it's out there. I think this is the, the reasonable thing to do is take responsibility for this and move it along. So thank you. Of course, thank you. Is there any way I can get? A time frame or an estimated time frame uh, when the PUC and PICO and the project is going to at least progress. So yeah, I'll let, I'm going to let Matt keep you updated, but I don't think we have any any information to give you right now because it's definitely in the the black hole of the PUC. <laughs> All right. Also, I, just let me uh, let me just chime in for just a moment and say that the the lights do light up the public sidewalk along close to Montgomery mm -hmm. Avenue. So it is in the in an there's, area. There's a, public, there's a public use here. Yeah, it's a public use. Yeah. 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 It's it's and, not and just right. it's not just that the bills are unpaid, right? I mean, they they actually don't work. So even if you were to pay Pico the twenty dollars a month, it wouldn't be on. We need to actually physically replace them. To, to make um, it work? I, Is that the understanding? Uh, no, I think they, I, they they were working until the electric went out. Um, but they do need a lot of maintenance. It's a bus stop there. The kids wait for the school bus there. Uh, so it can be very, you know, dangerous in that regard with, with some of the masonry falling off. Um, but the, the, as far as I know, right. the, electric, the electric lines are in good order. Uh, it's just that... Uh, the electric bill has not been paid. And uh, we would like to uh, make those lampposts not orphans anymore by having them included in the street light program. I mean, I would, I would actually be in favor of us starting to pay the electric bill until we can replace them. I mean, if that's possible. I mean, I, I like the idea of the lights being on. <laughs> Sean, John, do you see any issues there? How it's much fairly is owed? de minimis. Yeah, how much is, is I mean, we imagine there's, is there anything back owed on it or do they just shut it off immediately? I mean, no, I, it I would, can't imagine it'd be much if it was only 20 or 30 a month. Uh, it was just shut off. And I have a couple of the bills from uh, 
July of 2019, August 2019. One was, yeah, they, they, they come out to $26.99. Jerry, so am I right that there, 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 there is no formal homeowners association or any sort of entity for, for the Correct. court? Grant Absolutely court. not. Uh, I'm not an original owner, but from what I understand and speaking with the few original owners, it was all a very informal association. In fact, when Hanson Court was built, it was built by three separate builders. The last builder finished the last house and moved on, but uh, somebody had commented, well, we need lights at the entrance. And so uh, uh, the builder came back and built those two pillars with the lights on them. Um, in fact, Hanson Court, uh, at one time, uh, Norberth, in the very beginning, Norberth did not want to do trash pickup at Hanson Court, and the original residents refused to pay taxes until the borough council at that time uh, decided they were going to take care of the road, they were going to take care of the trash, and they put, put the street lamps in there as well after the residents uh, put, put, put all their tax money in escrow. So that's just a little bit of history from it. President Muter, to answer your question, I don't see any legal issue with, with paying the bills. We're, we're still not taking ownership at that time. From a long-term point of view, I probably would, would recommend at least having some sort of an agreement with the two landowners that those abut up against, even if it's not uh, directly on their property, just so they do disclaim any interest that they have with it. Uh, and then we'd just proceed with okay. it uh, as a right of way. Bob? Yeah, I just, I hear us not having any objections to taking ownership of the lights and paying for the improvements in the bills, but are we, are we agreeing that we're taking ownership also or of the, uh, the lamp, those piers that the lights are on? Because, uh, you know, I don't, you know, they're in the right of way there. I don't know who's been maintaining them. Do you, what's the yeah, other, I think what's that's our what we're talking about. about. I think that's what we're talking about and, oh, and the, probably removing I, them. I, Correct. Oh, okay. Because I'd like to not uh, see us get involved in maintaining, the, you know, right. the, the common space of, of Hanson Court. Yeah. It's one thing to do the lights. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. Okay. Um, okay. Well, we'll, uh, we'll uh, hand this, Matt, uh, small, a small piece of a big job. And uh, I do with that. I do appreciate it. Thank you. Uh, would you mind if I, um, uh, we need to disseminate some status to the residents here. Um, uh, I'd be glad well, to. I'll have the office, the office can craft sort of official language of what we're doing and, and okay. give an expectation of timeline and, and steps. And then let's get that to you in writing um, or to the Hanson Court residents in writing. Um, I wouldn't want to sort of do a whisper down the lane because there are, we're doing this a little informally here and there's a lot of loose details and I don't want to set the wrong expectations. I appreciate it. Uh, thank you very much. I appreciate your time and your courtesy and all your efforts. Thank, thank you. Um, with that, we'll move to section seven, public comment. Um, any members of the public who would wish to comment? Mr. Lyons, I think you've said what you need to say. I see uh, Carol Marie Scanlon. Yes, Aaron. Hi, it's Carol Marie Scanlon, Sabine Avenue. I just would like to let you and council know that the meeting on October 27th that is scheduled about talking about the redevelopment of the Sabine Avenue property, the public does not seem to know about it. I've met right. 20 people this past week that weekend that have absolutely no clue. They haven't gotten an email, a, uh, a notification in their mailbox, it, yes, it is on the website, but if you don't know to look to the website to look for this specific meeting, then people don't know about it. So I would like to ask how the borough council is going to be alerting the wide variety of neighbors as to the meeting, because this is a huge, important um, meeting talking about the future of one of the borough properties and the park. Okay. I uh, thank you for that. I agree that it should be well advertised. Um, I don't know if, given you're the only commenter here, Sean, do you have any thoughts or? Um, yeah, we're gonna we're gonna use Facebook, email, and we can put something in our kiosks around town. 
Um, there's four of those located, one at the library, one at the train station, one at the post office, and one at 21 Sabon on the Essex side. Um, it is cost prohibitive for us to develop something in, in, as, as a mailer. You're, you're talking a pretty big expense there. Um, so that won't be part of our outreach. I guess it's okay. discouraging because not everybody uses internet or the Facebook. And some of the people that I have spoken with had absolutely no idea and they have no, um, you know, they're, it's just, I was, I was surprised how many people have absolutely no idea what's going on, that there's a possibility of the change of the property with redevelopment. And what will, was the well, we, way to connect those people you spoke to, to the process, in your opinion? I think a um, blanket the town with flyers, like flyers. in each and every mailbox. If this, <coughs> if the property is going to be developed or sold or, you know, anything changes onto it that, that changes the uh, residents and the, the what's available to the residents, every resident needs to know because we all have a stake in the game. Okay, well... Uh, we will look at the what we can add to the communications plan, and it may it may not be a flyer in every mailbox. Although we do have a volunteer group that might be capable of of helping with that um, to make it cost effective, but maybe um, some uh, some other flyers put up outside of just maybe the kiosks, um, and since our sort of normal public life routines have been disrupted during this. We'll see. Which how is we can very get it true. Out. People aren't walking around as much as they were before. Right. We're, well, in some cases, they're, they're walking more because there's nothing else to do. Uh, but, Good point. <laughs> Thank know, you, Aaron. Let's see where we go. All right. Thank you. Um, hearing no other public comment, I'll just give a quick opportunity in case someone is commenting on the Civic Association YouTube um, for Jim. I'll just give him 30 seconds here. And we'll move to action items. All right, hearing none, action items, um, 8A, uh, which is um, adoption of the capital plan. Can I get a motion? Yes, I'd like to make a motion to adopt the capital plan and budget. Is there a second? A second. Great. Is there any further discussion? So, I, Sean, I think the if I understood that conversation we had earlier, the consensus was to add to roadways, um, you know, the sidewalk and other public health improvements just to the description field um, to make future councils aware that, that that's sort of our vision there. Bob? Traffic coming, yeah. Traffic coming, thank you. Okay, um, any other discussion? All in favor? Aye. Any opposed? None. The capital plan is unanimously approved. Um, thank you to everyone in different committees and council members who participated and especially thanks to the office and professional staff again for um, bringing us to the era where the borough has a capital plan. It's much appreciated. Um, 8B. I believe this is gonna to go to Mr. Bush under infrastructure, uh, which is a motion to um, for traffic engineer. Okay. Uh, I move that we approve traffic engineering services. Oh, it was actually uh, Cindy, but either way, my bad. Uh, okay, is there a second? A second. Seconded, thank you. Um, Mr. Metric, do you wanna give us a little background? Yeah, the proposal was put together for us by uh, Pannoni, um, which is also the borough's engineering firm. Um, it's uh, for uh, traffic engineering services that would commence immediately. And uh, we have been assigned a uh, traffic engineer. I spoke to the uh, municipal services departmental director, Joe Mastronardo, explained our situation and what's unique to Narberth and what's what kinds of skills and um, um, fluency and in, in that we're looking for in a traffic engineer that's someone who can navigate complex uh, users and uses in a small space. We're not looking for the PennDOT engineer who can uh, manufacture uh, 
you know, roadways that, that safely navigate 30,000 cars a day. We're looking at very low volumes. We're looking at um, traffic calming. We're looking at uh, small cartways and we need someone who is versed in integrating uh, stormwater improvements into our streetway designs. So uh, Michael Schneider will be working with us. Matt and I have a meeting with him to go over active traffic engineering projects should the borough choose to uh, approve this uh, contract for services. I've reviewed the <coughs> uh, service fees. They're actually a little bit lower than what we were getting from um, the prior traffic engineer, but um, emphasis on the little, a little bit lower on the hour, hourly rate. Okay, thank you. Any questions for the borough manager or general discussion? All in favor of approving the traffic engineering services for Pannoni? All right. Any opposed? None. It's unanimous. Thank you. A C. Public health and safety. Motion to uh, approve utility providers for renewable resources. Okay, I, I, I move to approve utility providers for renewable resources. This is for borough buildings electric. Is there a second? Seconded by Mr. Bush. Um, background, Mr. West. Thank you, Mr. President. Um, so in response to um, continued discussions with council and from the goals that were established by the Climate Action Plan. Um, I made contact with the borough's electric provider um, and I inquired about the costs associated with changing the source of generation for only borough-owned consumption um, to renewable sources. Uh, so I received a quote uh, from our supplier and they can switch the borough's energy supply to 100% green E-certified wind um, for a new contract price that would be just under 3% more than what we're paying now. Um, the reason that, why it's being brought to council is that the minor detail is about this, um, uh, regarding this change, is that in order to make it happen, um, our electric provider is requiring that this difference in rate be paid in a one-time payment. And that one-time payment is $1,371. While it's not a lot, um, it's still enough that I wanted to bring it to council for your approval. Um, and this is for the remainder. It would start from November 2020 next month uh, if council chooses to go forward with this. And it will um, be in effect for our current contract, which expires December 2022. Um, I asked, you know, where they came up with that number. How can you, you know, know that rate if, if it's based on consumption? And the answer that was given to me was that they have really good long-term data for our usage and are confident that this is what um, it's going to cost them. So tonight I'm asking for council to approve this one-time payment to Constellation Energy to switch the borough's electric provider to 100% green E certified wind in the amount of $1,371. And I just wanted to be clear that this is for only for borough-owned electric consumption. It's not for um, any other location in the borough. It's not re you know, individual residents um, throughout the borough. However, I want to take this time um, to encourage residents to contact PICO to inquire about making the switch on their own to 100% renewable. That's it. Question, quick question, Matt. So if we were to use less, would, would I mean, we're paying them a lump sum on the assumption that this is going to be the 3%. If we actually used less energy, would we, would they credit us that at the end of our term or is that just? Um, I don't believe so. Um, it might be a negotiation if we choose to continue our long-term engagement with Constellation at that time. That could be a bargaining chip um, with them. I was, um, I was just thinking our, our, I mean, our electric use is likely to go down significantly once we replace our streetlights, right? So. Yep. This, but okay. this does not include the streetlights. Oh, it doesn't. Okay. I thought that those were borough no. owned. I'm sorry. My apologies. Okay. No, because they're not currently borough owned. So, right. so okay. in fact, we okay, would thanks. be adding the streetlights at some point. Thank you. Right. That clarifies. Uh, any other questions? All right. All in favor? Aye. Any opposed? None. It's a magic world we've come to where 100% green energy is only 3% more. Who would have thunk? 8D. Um, 
Uh, I'd like to I'm gonna, make... Yes. Sorry, I was going to make the motion and have the discussion, but I'll be quiet. So yeah, I, I, I'm thinking about how I'm gonna how I'd like to structure this. So we're gonna we're gonna appoint members to the parking study task force. I think we had discussed it as a ten member body, five members of the public, and then five members sort of chosen from different organizations to represent the borough. Um, I think Cindy, if you'd like to put this on the table, and then we can um, work a sub motion. Uh, to put names into the roster. I think that would be the, the best plan. Okay. Go ahead. Uh, I move to appoint members to the Narworth Parking Study Task Force. Is there a second? Fred's got the second. Okay. Um, let's let's do the, the, the five that are um, representative of the community first, so that I think we, we sort of all know who's, who's on there. Um, and Michelle... Uh, I had discussed this with you prior to the meeting. You can help me. Um, we had our mayor. Sure. Yeah. So the five that we, we would have a borough administration rep representative to be appointed by the borough manager. We have mm -hmm. a public safety function representative to be appointed by the mayor or to be the mayor at our discretion. Mm -hmm. We have a representative from council to be appointed by you, Aaron, council president. The Narbuth yep. Business Association will be appointing yep. a representative, and the Narbuth Civic Association will be appointing a representative. Okay. So with so with those organizations tasked, um, then we have five additional spots, and I think um, I'll just sort of take nominations, um, and then we could vote on each one, and then when we have a final list, we'll close out this motion with a vote you know, to endorse the entire package. Go ahead, Cindy. I just thought I wanted to share when I looked at, we had 17 applicants, volunteers, which is pretty amazing. Um, mm -hmm. Thank you for that outreach infrastructure. Michelle, I was thinking about, you know, what kind of diversity do we need of thought for these five slots, given that we had 17 folks? And I just, before I throw a name out, I just wanted to share my thinking was, you know, we needed someone from both the north side and the south side. So all of Narworth was represented. Um, Differences in age, so you had uh, senior members of the community and community members with young kids, um, anyone with mobility issues that may have additional barriers to parking. And, you know, coming from someone who has no off-street parking, um, I do think that's an important voice to have someone who doesn't have access to a driveway. Oh, yeah, Aaron, you too. Um, so the, you too. That's what guided, um, those were kind of the variables I used to identify what would lead to diverse thought on the task force. And then I looked at those numbers. So I, I just wanted to share that before we threw names out because I, I wasn't sure how other people were kind of um, assessing volunteers. Did anyone, any other council members have sort of different criteria they wanted to talk about? Yeah, I think it's important to add, um, wait, can you hear me? I, yes. I, that was a good list, Cindy. Um, I would also add to that list um, people who commute by car from Narber to Narber to the train station in Narber or to the near the train station in Narber. Um, and I would also okay. add people who live in neighborhoods where train commuters park regularly. Uh, okay. Yeah, and these are these are criteria that we talked about when we when we talked about forming the committee in July, and I think that these are things we've all had in mind. I, it's not possible probably to find five people who can necessarily bring all those representations to the table, but it's it's also not not necessary that we literally have, you know. But I, I, those those are some of the things those are some of the things that I looked at really closely too, Cindy. I really agree with you that that's important and. Um, you know, also a number of the applicants, I mean, if a 17, it was, a, it was a lot to look at, but a number of the applicants really took a great deal of time to write lengthy and very thoughtful letters sort of discussing in, in a lot with a lot of detail their backgrounds, how their backgrounds apply to the task at hand, uh, why they have an interest in these in these decisions, whether it's personal experience, their background or some combination of the two. I want to thank everybody mm -hmm. who took the time to do that. Um, it was really, uh, 
it was really heartening to see how much interest there is. It's very hard to choose, but I also really took, for me, it was very important to look at how much, um, how much thought somebody had put into the process already. So. Okay. Thank you. Yeah. I think, I think we might be able to hit a lot of those criteria, uh, with these names. There's some overlap. Um, so would someone like to maybe uh, throw out a first, we'll do them one by one and sort of fill the five slots. Um, maybe throw out a first name. Cindy, you were quick, quick on the draw. Um, well, I, I'd like to nominate our only Southside applicant. Okay. Um, which is Cindy Ridgeway. Cindy Ridgeway. I'm known as Southside Cindy. Okay. So we'll, 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 how about we, we, uh, we build a little slate here so we can kind of see how we're meeting all the criteria, right? Um, all right, Mona. Um, I, I, not everybody wrote their address on their letters that I saw. Is there, how do we know? Were they asked to and just not everybody did? I think yeah. for the most part, people either- Not everybody their, did. Some either put their address not. or they filled out the survey which contained an indication of what zoning district they lived in, or they gave an indication in what they wrote okay. their I own personal it. parking experience, or they, or they didn't. Okay, because I see the results of the survey. I saw that link, but I don't see what the actual full survey questions are. I just see an Excel spreadsheet with like... Yeah, each, each applicant's survey responses are in that notebook too, if you want to look at them, but they're, you know... Oh, that's what I, but that's what I clicked on, but I don't, it, I see the... I clicked on the link for the summary of survey responses, but. Oh, Mona, you're in the wrong place because I see where you're on the Excel sheet. If, oh. if, if you move over to the OneNote, Michelle. Okay. I, was, I was on the OneNote. <laughs> okay. I see summary of survey, the second top thing on the OneNote. Oh, to the bottom where it says summary of survey down there. No, you want to go over to the notebook? It's purple. It says OneNote. Okay, that's what I'm. Um, I haven't used this before, so then I'm lost. But okay, I um, I <laughs> I would like to nominate Susie Stout as someone who seems to me to be the youngest person that has applied, and someone who lives close to the downtown, and also has experience with parking enforcement. I think some of her experience would make her really valuable on the task force. Okay. Anyone else? Fred? Sure. Um, I'd like to uh, nominate Jean Burrock, who um, you know, has a lot of experience uh, with the cycling club and also is the only one who marked that uh, she had a young child um, in the household, which was one of the factors we were looking at. OK. Um, OK, I would like to nominate Garrett Bergman. Um, as a 47-year resident of the borough um, who has a very interesting background. He's both a doctor and, and an MBA, and uh, his application suggests that he put a lot of thought. He's put a lot of thought into this and has a lot to add to the committee in addition to being, uh, being able to represent the interests of, you know, someone who's lived here for a long time and uh, has a lot of time to put into it because he's a retiree. He seems very interested in participating. And his wife actually owns some commercial real estate in the borough and that helps bring um, an interesting perspective to that as well. Okay. Um, anyone else? I mean, are we, are, we, are we kind of doing like one nomination a piece? Are we allowed to each nominate more than well, one? Well, I'm, I'm sort of trying to come up with five and, and see that there's some balance and then and then we uh, can discuss any, if there's another name that might be a better balanced fit to, to hit all of those goals that you discussed. So uh, Gary, um, someone had mentioned Abe to me. Yeah, Abe, um, Abe Heller, who had, was at our meeting a couple months ago, um, is something of you, I would nominate Abe Heller as well. Um, he has a, an urban studies and policy background. He does analytical work. Um, he was clean, obviously keenly interested in this. He's already read the parking study. You get brownie points for that. Um, he's someone who has uh, some experience in his family with somebody with mobility issues and sort of understands some of the additional challenges um, that that can present for parking. So I would nominate okay. Abe as well. Okay, let's put Abe and um, 
Jean is young with children. I'm, I'm sort of tallying the different criteria here. Aaron, if I can hop in again, I'm sorry. I, I just want to point out we only had one person that actually doesn't have yeah. street parking, and that is Lisa. So I, I know I nominated one person, but I, I would like to really underscore her candidacy as someone who, who doesn't have guaranteed parking. Okay. Um, okay. Well, I think that not have, being that I fall into that class as you do, Cindy, of not having any off-street parking, I do really think that's an important consideration. Um, how does the rest of council feel about, about that as a criteria? We sort of covered north south. We've covered um, older uh, older in age and and length of tenure. We've covered um, uh, you know mobility issues. Um, some of the south also is in a commuter area. Um, help me with the other criteria, Aaron. I th I think that's a very important criteria, not having parking. Mm hmm. A driveway. Yeah. Okay. Can I ask, are we stuck at 10? Is there a possibility of putting 11 if they think there's value in adding the extra person? Um, I, I, I know that we might want to defer to Sean because he's the, he's the one who's actually had a conversation with our facilitator in the county, but I believe they'd said that the sort of right size for, for a task force at this source would be 8 to 10. So we're kind of on the high side by by going with 10 numbers. Yeah, that was the feedback that I got as well. Yeah. Um, I, go ahead. I would just caution expanding too. I mean, I think you get to the point where you lose production and there's so many people that are so qualified. I, I would encourage us to stick to 10 or below. What's, uh, can I get Lisa's last name? Just, I have too many pieces of paper in front of me here. McCann. McCann. McCann, yeah. Um, Lisa's been here a long time as well, hasn't she? Yeah, I think she served on the library board at one and point. And she has, uh, yeah, prior service. Prior service. Okay, I mean we're we're playing a game here, but I'm going to throw out a suggestion, um, which is actually give me give me 15 seconds. I think. If you make a slate, Cindy Ridgeway, Lisa McCann, Jean Burak, Gary Bergman, Abe Heller. I'm throwing it out there. That's five names. Age balance. We have you repeat that parking again. circumstances. Yeah, no, I think that's good. Okay. Um, so then those would be the 10, and I just point out, uh, there's also a county facilitator from MCPC who is uh, sort of guiding us in, in this work product. All right, all in favor of the 10 members of the parking task force being uh, an appointee, the mayor or her appointee, the borough manager or his appointee, um, a council appointee, um, an appointee from the Business Association, an appointee from the Civic Association, Cindy Ridgeway, Lisa McCann, Jean Burak, Gary Bergman, and Abe Heller. Uh, say aye. 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 All right, any opposed? Nay. Okay. Um, it is approved, six to one, and um, we look forward to a work product from them in March. That's the timeline. All right, thank you. Uh, moving to 8E, Finance and Administration. Thanks, I move to allocate state aid for local pension funds to the police pension fund. Is there a second? I'll second. Thank you, Fred. Sorry, I didn't see you. Um, any discussion? All in favor? But 
what is what are we doing? I'm just what what is this? I'm because we we get the we get the money and we have to put it in the pension fund. Oh, okay, that's all. All right. <laughs> yeah. Can I add something to this? Go ahead. Uh, yeah, thanks, uh, Mr. President. Um, the reason that I wanted to bring this to council's uh, attention is that we actually received more money from the state than we budgeted for 2020. And so I want um, council's approval to allocate the additional $11,400 to the police pension fund. Um, this is from the Commonwealth's annual um, municipal pensions state uh, system state aid. Um, we were allocated the amount of $103,400 and 49 cents. And um, we had budgeted uh, $92,000 for this deposit this year. And um, uh, in a nutshell, Act 205, which is what it's also referred to, um, is that it's very specific and that this money has to be deposited into a, a um, pension plan. It can be a police pension plan or it can be a, a non-uniform pension plan also. Um, in conferring with um, Mr. Metric, uh, we recommend that the additional $11,400 just be, um, the entire sum be deposited into our police pension plan. Thank you. Okay. Everyone good? All in favor? Aye. Any opposed? None. All right. Thank you. Um, announcements? Dare I suggest a fall council Zoom open house? Is everybody Zoomed out and, not, <laughs> and nobody council or community wants to get on Zoom again? Okay, I'm reading that as like, yes, don't make me get on another Zoom. How about I'll email you all? Okay, I won't put anyone on the spot. Okay. Cindy, why don't, if, if you don't mind, uh, Aaron, Cindy, why don't you contact me? Because we were putting some plans in, in the works uh, to do our, to do an event in the fall for boards and commissions with our appointments. Oh. So why, why don't we just maybe get a, get a council Great. person or two into oh, that's that, a good idea. into that state Perfect. as well. Love it. Thank you. We just don't have Cindy, to Cindy also, and I, I, uh, if everyone wants another Zoom, the Narbor Civic Association is doing its um, annual meeting um, next Tuesday night. Um, it's an opportunity to hear me speak for a long period of time about the state of the borough and things that have happened in the past 12 months, but also an opportunity to see neighbors um, and a different segment of the sort of uh, civically interested in our community. So, um, Sean, we had discussed... Uh, Kathy Valentine, do we have anything to bring up at this point? Nothing yet. Okay, thanks. Um, all right, I'll take a motion to adjourn and then we will go into executive session briefly to conclude our business from earlier. Anyone want to make that motion? Michelle moves to adjourn. I, I move to adjourn. Is there a second? Rob, all in favor? Aye. Couple more. Thank you. All right, executive session. Have a good night, Civic Association and Carol Marie and John Gallagher.